So welcome everyone. Um, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GLC 30A, this meeting of the Council on Aging is being conducted via remote participation. This meeting is also being recorded. So let's do a roll call to check and make sure everyone's video and audio is working properly. And um, in general, I think it's best if you mute your sound so that um, we don't get any background noises like phones ringing and <clears throat> cell phone interruptions. Um, and then um, just unmute when you um, identify yourself. So um, first of all, Sue Dirks. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. Uh -huh. Richard Koffler. I'm here. Okay, Jack Wallensack. I'm here. Yvette. I'm here. Thank you. Um, Pat Rector. I'm here. Uh, Jacqueline Smith Crooks. Greg Bascom. And Tim Neal. Uh, welcome. Okay, thank you. So I call the meeting to order, and this is a time when anyone from the public can may, is welcome to make a comment or express their views for up to three minutes. If you wish to speak, use the raise hand icon on the lower part of your screen or dial star nine if you are on the phone. And it's just a reminder to um, speak clearly, identify yourself and where you live. Are there any public comments at this time? Okay, well, let, then let's proceed. And for board members, um, if you wish to speak, since you're muted, um, you don't use, need to use the raise hand icon. Simply raise your hand like so if you have a question for anybody who is speaking or if you have a comment to make. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay, and for Yvette who is on the phone, you press star nine if you want to make a comment. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so let's go to the agenda and I think you probably all have the agenda in front of you. Um, we will start with um, presentations and discussion and I think that um, Jacqueline had a comment to make, but she is not present yet. So let's go forward. And um, if you would start, Mary Beth, um, with the status of operations at the Senior Center during the COVID lockdown. And of course, we're all very eager to know what the plan is going forward. Yeah, thank you, Rosemary. And I just want to note for the record, Sue, as the secretary, I did see that Greg uh, Bascom was um, dialed in as a panelist and then he so when you took roll call he was present he's he was listed in the side panel under panelists but then I've noticed that it looks like he just perhaps disappeared um, and I don't um, I don't know if you I just wanted to make sure that you, you noted that he was he was present and then I just before I begin in terms of the public comment because sometimes it takes a while to figure out how to use the functions. It looks like one of the phone numbers that's dialed in 2560104, there's a raised hand. So um, if you want, I can, um, it says that it's indicated that talking is permitted and not if we want to um, allow that person um, to comment before you switch over to me. Uh, Thank you. This is Jacqueline. Oh, great. Good morning, yeah, I, Jacqueline. Good morning. I'm sorry. I had trouble getting in on Zoom 
And it looks like I had a little trouble getting here on the phone because I didn't show up on the line. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And Jacqueline, um, yeah. as I understand it, you had wanted to make a comment at the beginning of the meeting? Uh, yes. Um, there's there's so much going on around us and our lives take us in so many different directions as how we're translating it. I wanted to, uh, as an African-American, a member of uh, the community of Amherst and the council, um, it behooves me to be quiet, to be silent when the emotions are so very high within myself and people with whom I interact on a daily basis. And there are other emotions that are high for me, seeing young people take the lead to make a difference and hopefully to make a longer term difference. Even as we enter this stage of our lives, and some of us can bask in it more so than others, the age of generativity, I think that there are still points uh, or places of opening for us to grow. I wanted to share there are so many readings from Howard Thurman, the spiritual, he was a spiritual advisor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and many people on his staff. Um, he had close connections to Mahatma Gandhi and he had earned a, a memory in his own right there's one of his reflections for me, and I, while I wear the collar, I, I'm not here to proselytize, but to energize us in terms of recognizing our rightly places in the whole scheme of things as elders. One of his reflections for me is called, Lord, Lord, open unto me. And this is not to re about religiosity, but spirituality. And I would ask you to join me, if you would, in, in asking open up after each statement, open unto me, and then I will, I will continue with that, that line with what it is being asked to open if you choose. If you choose not to recite open unto me, you can forego it. For those who would like to join me, would you be willing to do so, first of all? Yes. 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 I, yes. All right. I ask you to just listen after I recite the last word of the line, what it is we're asking for openness to be, to go on to the next line, which would be open unto me. Together, we'll start the first line. Open unto me. Open unto me. Open Light unto for me. me. Light for my darkness. Open unto me. Courage for my fear. Open unto me. Hope for my despair. Open unto me. Peace for my turmoil. Open unto me. Joy for my sorrow. Open unto me. Strength for my weakness. Open unto me. Wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me. 
forgiveness for my sin. Oh, open open unto me. Unto me. Tenderness for my toughness. Open, open unto, unto me. me. Love for my hate. Open, open unto, unto me. me. The divine for my own self. Open, open unto, unto me. me. Open unto me. Open unto me. Open unto me. Open unto me. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. You're welcome. Sue? Uh, Jacqueline, would you please email me that uh, reference for the poll? I will. It, it is going to read a little bit differently because I, I modified it for a secular audience. Yes. Thank it you. won't be much different. I will be glad to share that. And, and who's, who's asking for it? Sue Dirks, the secretary. Okay. Actually, actually um, Jacqueline, I think I would appreciate that also. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Okay, Mary Beth, you um, want to say a bit about what's been going on behind those closed doors and also what you think will happen going forward. Yeah. And so I think that we should all just take a, a big deep breath because that, I think that was a really beautiful way to sort of center us and, and begin this really from a reflected and grounded point because I think we meet amidst a, an epic time in our community, in our nation. And um, there's, there's much going on uh, beyond the senior center that affects us and also our mission and, and my job. And um, so let's just all take a big breath in and then you can let it go. And I just want to thank Jacqueline for offering those words and, um, and for reminding us about um, the importance of our work and the way in which what we do and the Council on Aging and the Senior Center affects people in many ways. So we help people physically with nutrition, we help people emotionally through connection, and we help people spiritually to connect to one another and to what is meaningful and what lights them up. Um, and I think it's important to, to hold all of that as we look at where we've been and also where we're going in this, in this new sort of dawning time. So thank you. Um, so where have we been? I just wanted to update you because, gosh, it, it seems like um, I haven't seen you all in, in a full year rather than a several months. Um, as you know, we had to close rather hastily in March with the pandemic coming and um, all of the safety uh, guidelines indicating that it would not be prudent to continue to operate as a functioning center. So. I think that one of the things um, that I would begin with is just to say, first of all, how immensely proud I am of my staff for how they performed under extreme duress with a lot of unknowns and, and really did so seamlessly. And also what a privilege it's been to be here in the town of Amherst working for all of you. Um, as odd as this may sound, I have never loved my job more and I've never had as much contact with so many seniors and to serve them in, in a very direct way, which was so very meaningful and also connecting. So um, it's been a, a, you know, a great time, I think, for the role of the Senior Center in the midst of a pandemic. Um, so as you know, we, uh, we closed um, the building, but uh, two of us stayed every day and we were continuing our nutrition operations. We had to release all of the volunteers, so we had well over 100 volunteers who help us to do what we do every day. Um, everybody, you know, um, you know, even those who wanted to stay, I asked that they go home and shelter in place because they were in that high risk category. So we were sort of left with a blank slate of how do we, how do we even just deliver meals when we have nobody left? 
Um, so we did a huge effort with recruitment and the town council and opportunities to speak to the public in those forums were really critical um, to uh, getting that word out and recruiting volunteers. Um, you know, we, we probably went through about four waves of them because it really was a very challenging time um, to be asking people to be going to homes to deliver, even in a contactless situation. Um, there were just so many unknowns, but, but we really did, um, you know, manage to execute all that we needed to do. As part of the staff operated remotely from home. And um, again, I, you know, it, it, um, they continued to provide all of the services for social work, for counseling, for support groups, uh, for shine counseling, housing assistance. So people had a really good safety network. Uh, in that way. And I think much of that was due to the fact that um, the town manager had had us for many weeks before we were closed down in anticipation of some event like this, preparing continuity of operation plans. And that really was critical to how we were just so easily able to seamlessly shift to a completely different format for delivering services. Um, and then we also continued, we, we, we've begun to go online with virtual operations. So things like Zoom meetings um, and Zoom classes. So, so those three things of being in person, being remote and virtual have really um, stayed the course in, in an unbelievable fashion. Um, since March, just by the numbers, if you want to know some of the things that we've done, we've delivered over 580 boxes and bags of food. So that's through the either the survival center, through uh, the Western Mass Food Bank, through our own emergency food uh, pantry, and then also working with Highland Valley. Um, they had um, delivered through USDA a special program where they were able to give out um, 10 pound boxes of meat to some of their uh, more needy clients. So, so we've been delivering a lot of food. Um, we've delivered well over 3,000 meals. Um, and we've made over, my staff just alone, aside from the volunteers who have stepped forward to make well-being calls, we've made over 1,800 calls since March. And um, you know, that I think only tells half of, of what we've been able to do. Um, our touch points, it might sound um, like, uh, we're doing sort of perfunctory things, delivering meals, but every opportunity, whether it was answering the phone or whether it was delivering a meal, we tried to have a multiplier effect and use any point of contact, both to have an extended conversation, check in, how are you doing? So someone might just call and say, oh, are you open? And I suppose an easy answer would be, no, we're sorry, we're not open and we don't know when we're going to open and you can hang up. But we would always, you know, every one of us, we had, um, you know, a, a format for how we would respond to each call to ask, how are you doing? What do you need? Is there anything I can get you? And if anything shifts and you have a need, please don't hesitate to call. We are always here. I can't tell you the number of times that somebody called and I answered the phone and, and people were shocked and they would say like, I can't believe somebody's there. And that, um, I think, knowledge of knowing that someone from the town was still there and we're, we're still taking calls, you know, if somebody needed a mask, I would deliver the mask. Did I have to? I suppose not. But, you know, again, that gave me just another opportunity to knock on the door, pop it in the mailbox, I'd step back, I'd wait for them to come out. And again, you know, I'd have an opportunity to see them. So how are you doing? What do you need? And people were delighted to see somebody from the town coming out and saying, I'm here for you. What do you need? I'm on your doorstep. You matter. Um, you know, I think it was a, a just an incredible uh, boost for morale and an inspirational spirit to say, we're still here, we're going to get through this. And people would say, oh, this was the highlight of my day, getting my mask. So um, it sounds like it might be simple, but the impact on people socially and emotionally from all of those touch points really mattered. So whether you were picking up a meal or whether we were delivering a mask, we tried to make sure that you knew that you were held and that you know we would continue to serve you. Um, so the things that we've continued to do throughout this, as I've mentioned, we did social work services, we provided shine counseling, we've been providing assistance with housing and housing issues. Uh, the home delivered meals have continued uh, without incident, even though we've gone through probably, like I said, four different waves of drivers. On average, we have about 16 people driving for us because we have four routes a day and five days a week. 
And then we've also expanded our outreach. So one of the interesting things, and this is not unique to Amherst, um, because I participate in bi-weekly calls within Western Mass for regional directors in Western Mass, and then a weekly call for statewide, all directors um, participate in the phone call, is we have found that the takeout lunches instead of the congregate lunch, so the congregate lunch was the dining um, you know, uh, in-house, in and, and for us at Amherst, we had very low attendance. We had maybe six to eight people on average. And now we have over 45 people who come and get a takeout lunch on a daily basis. So we're actually feeding more people. Um, and I, and I, and I'm, you know, I mentioned that in, in those kind of touch point calls. And if people in the public are watching this meeting or gonna watch it after it's recorded, please don't hesitate to call us at 259-3060 because it is a free meal that you are entitled to by the virtue of the fact that you have reached a certain age and that you've paid your taxes all your life. It is an entitlement um, and you know, it's, it's a great benefit. Even if you, know, you can pop a few in your freezer, you use them on a Saturday night. Um, they're wonderful meals, they're hot meals, but we serve them cold because of the, the number. But um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for some nutritional support and just some ease. Um, at a time when a lot of people have just been tired and, and um, making a meal might seem a bit daunting. So, um, and then if we look at, um, I think one of our, our biggest shifts that we've had is we've remodeled. And, and this I think is my greatest sadness about not being able to have you all at the Bang Center right now and give you a personal tour of the new look for the Bang Center. And, um, I was very touched, quite honestly, by the town's investment in the senior center and in seniors at this time. And I thought um, the juxtaposition between the fact that the pandemic was going on and, and really the brunt of it was being borne by seniors. And, and there was media attention saying that if there was a, a, um, uh, a lack of ventilators, seniors would be on the low end of getting one. So there was a there was a way in which um, in my calls with seniors during the, the, the real height of the surge, seniors felt particularly vulnerable and um, unseen. And amidst that, the town invested and said, you matter, we are going to give you a new place. Um, so we have all new flooring, we have new furniture, it's ADA compliant, so that if someone needs to use the sink, they can and then they're in a wheelchair, they can roll right underneath it so it's accessible, they can wash their hands when they're in the senior center. The furniture is all wipeable so that uh, when we are able to have guests inside, it's gonna be very easy to clean on a daily basis. Um, there's a new sort of a kitchen area with a new countertop and again, um, ease of wiping. There's no, they used to have a peninsula that blocked um, and was not ADA compliant for persons um, with a walker or a wheelchair to get by and that has been um, removed so that it's, it's more spacious and it also facilitates most importantly for us, um, it, it's sort of a process of, I hate to say the decluttering because that's an overused phrase, but there's, there are fewer things physically in the way that will help us to support social distancing when we can begin to invite guests back into the senior center, which will be a really critical piece because as you know, um, you know, we all have to go in and people have to check in and where would we, how, how would we manage that flow of persons? And there's just more room overall in, in that space of the initial welcome and in the, um, the social center. Um, so I, again, I just, I thank the town. I thank the town council, Sarah. It was just a tremendous, um, tremendous demonstration of value and worth and spoke to the worth and the wisdom that our seniors are. And now that we have a place that speaks to your value and your worth and your wisdom and, and how much you contribute to the community. So um, I, I, I'll be in touch with you. We're thinking of doing like a video opening and posting it online. Um, and taking people on a tour and having the town manager and maybe the town councilor in a socially distant way, somehow ribbon cutting from six feet apart, something where we can say, you know, here we, here we are and um, let you all take a peek. But I, I look so forward to having you back into the space. So our operations have changed 
and our landscape has changed, but certainly I hope what you feel is enduring is our commitment to you and that you remain the center of our efforts and that every choice, every decision I make and that the town makes is how can we serve you better? How can we serve you more? Um, and uh, you know, I look forward to, to doing more of that work for you. Moving forward in terms of when you ask, uh, what is our plan? I uh, participate and I'm serving on the Massachusetts Council on Aging Task Force for Reopening Guidelines. So that is chaired by uh, individuals who are uh, employees of the Massachusetts Council on Aging, along with guidance from Department of Public Health, which has been really critical and helpful, and then a group of directors from across the state. And we represent a variety of um, senior centers from small ones such as ourselves um, to very large um, entities. So, uh, you know, so there's a number, they could get uh, a wide range of opinions and also um, looking at guidelines from a variety of perspectives. So um, looking at the footprint of a senior center really has some critical impacts on, on what we're able to do or what we're not able to do. So we have been, though we are not necessarily open at this time, uh, in terms of a physical plant, we have been trying to use this time uh, to devise guidelines for all activities. So that, that includes use, opening the social center, how to run classes, um, how to do transportation. So we have a variety of documents. They're all available on the website for it's uh, MCOA, Massachusetts Council on Aging. And the documents now have pretty much all been published. Most of our work has been completed. Um, and if you look at those documents, um, there's a tremendous amount of planning. So we have been using this time to sort of inventory our space and then go around and, and plan for what is it that we would need? How do we need to change things? You know, everything from how do you scan in? How do you welcome people? Where will people stand when they come into the senior center so that they're still physically distanced? Where would sanitation stations be? How would we make sure that things are accessible to, to persons um, who might have, um, who are able, have different able abilities? Um, and so we've been in that, that discussion and process um, and I think that, that what I would say is, you know, the footprint of our senior center, I think, determines a lot. And contextually, the fact that we're within the bank center also impacts um, a lot of our decisions. So, and I think that um, there is um, still, I guess, we're, we're, we're still looking for some more um, guidance. And I think we're kind of, uh, we're waiting to see how things unfold uh, with the virus and with the town's needs for the bank center. So we remain, the bank center remains an alternate location if people need to be spaced out from town hall or other employees um, don't have sufficient um, space or um, distance from other um, workers. Town employees came back on Monday and so it's a process that is um, at this point in time still unfolding. So we're waiting to see also looking at the rooms, what might be available, will we still have uh, access to all of the rooms or some of the rooms? Um, and then I, you know, there was a decision I'm sure that you all heard from the um, town manager that he set a January one as a, a date like that the senior center would not open until January one or that it would be reviewed on January one. And I think that um, what, I, what I would suggest to, to folks is that um, I think that that was to set expectations that the process of reopening will be slow, it will be partial, and it may take a period of time to see what the course of the virus will be. Um, there is certainly an intention that we will be able to at some point partially open. And, and, and as always, as all the decisions of the town, which have really um, postured us in a great position, medically and physically, um, they will always be guided by the science. So at this time, I know that the bank center also has a day of Labor Day to, to look at whether it would be op you know, opening around that time period. So I don't anticipate a, an immediate opening um, at this time uh, for the senior center. So the, the, uh, the official word is that 
We will be closed until January 1, but we will continue to look at the conditions. We will continue to look at the situation and, we'll, and we really will be guided by, by science and what's sort of in the medical uh, best interests of how we can provide a safe location for everybody. Um, I wanted to also say that um, within my work in um, the MCOA task force, that the guidance that, that we have been providing really has, has been um, in sync with what our decision has been in the town of Amherst. We've been looking at what are um, the executive orders of the governor, which at this time still remains safer at home. So for individuals who are 65 and older, um, they are asked and reminded to, and advised to stay home um, unless they uh, have to take a trip to one of the establishments that are now open in step one of phase two. And I think that there is great caution nationwide in terms of providing guidance to seniors about reopening. Um, you know, I, we, um, I was, last night I was, I was trying to prepare some remarks for this and I was reading um, an article that was on National Public Radio. It was an interview with an epidemiologist, Michael Osterholm. And, and he spoke to the fact, and I think, and, I, and I've had a conversation also um, with Liz Welsh at Amherst Neighbors. We were talking about this earlier this week about there seems, there, there can be some confusion for seniors around, is it safe? Like all, around us, we see things opening what can I do? I, I see people going out to dinner. You know, can I go out to dinner? What, what is the, um, the precise uh, advice that we should be giving? And, and I think that people are suffering a lot from that, you know, the phrase of pandemic fatigue, of being tired of following the rules, of being home, um, and of being socially distanced. And um, everything that I read and the advice that I receive, both from our own Board of Health and from um, you know, the, the state government is that it's not a time to, to let up for seniors. And that um, it continues, the virus continues to transmit. It is still present and we anticipate you know, that it will be present for a good long while until we have a vaccine. And so though it, it is tiresome, I think that seniors are certainly, a, we are a bit, I think, better postured to be patient and to be creative and to find um, small other ways, hopefully, that we can continue to connect, whether it be um, in micro bubbles within small family settings, or whether it be within a small community and socially distanced. But the messaging around wearing a mask and washing your hands and, and performing social distance is still the, the, the best advice and the best way that we know to keep people safe. Um, you know, we are constantly assessing the risk um, as I go through each activity at the senior center. So whether we're talking about one-to-one -one meetings, whether we're talking about resumption of any services or even classes, you know, there, there are so many pieces to it around what is the air exchange? What is the airflow? Um, and I think that everybody um, agrees that to bring people indoors for an extended period of time uh, sharing air, even from a socially distant posture, is still at this time there, there is inherent risk. Um, so in light of that, we've been trying to be as creative as possible. Um, and uh, I'm preparing the, the latest newsletter to send out. And I just wanted you to, to have a sense of sort of how can we move forward and continue to engage people so that they don't feel lonely, so they feel like they have a modicum of movement and uh, agency over themselves and, and having, um, having some, some, you know, lack of it, fun and socialization. So we have shifted a lot of our classes online. And, it, and, and just like our experiment with the takeout um, food, where we have gone from six people to 45 people, well, we found the same thing. So our Healthy Bones class, we now have 50 people online taking that class. So we're actually increasing our contact and our outreach to people by doing classes online, interestingly enough. 
Um, and, and again, that is not a, a, something that is unique to Amherst. Across the, the whole state, we are all seeing this as directors, that attendance at classes is actually increasing. We have um, a chair yoga that is also a Zoom class. I had another um, yoga teacher who her classes are now on Amherst Media. So she recorded them and I worked with them to put them online. And they show on Friday nights, I think, and then like a, a Sunday morning. And those, those times and dates are in the, um, in the um, newsletter. Um, I, folk dancing is online. I haven't attended that class yet, but I, I don't know how we folk dance together online, but, but that, that's going to be a fun one. I try, I'm trying to pop into classes and just say hi to everybody. Um, we also, our cosmology class, which has been a long um, venerated favorite, continues to be online. Um, both of our support groups have transferred online. So our grief support group and our caregiver support group is online. And we also are providing that assistance through telephone conference because we recognize that there is a significant digital divide. And so when we are doing groups for people who don't have the ability to go online, we've also been running them as a telephone conference uh, call so that people can just phone from uh, you know their landline or their cell phone and have the same experience um, we also have some special events coming up and some additional new groups so i um sarah uh, snyder who's who, uh, many of you know she used to come to the center once a month for joy of song and she'd play music she has agreed to be uh, a sort of a mobile minstrel and I it will be in the newsletter if people want to have a mini concert or you know from socially distance so she'll, she'll come up roll up on a curbside and you know if you want to send it for a birthday greeting an anniversary greeting or maybe even just to cheer somebody up in the neighborhood um, she, you know the senior center we're going to support her and we will go out with her and we'll sing to you and uh, she brings her ukulele and we will be uh, all about town there um, UMass Psychological Services, so I know uh, Rosemary is familiar with it, and I think Norma attended too, maybe. So uh, we did the Live Your Best Life series this, this um, past spring, and um, uh, Dr. Bruna Martins came to the, uh, one of our classes along with some of her doctoral students, and it was fabulous, and so she is going to be doing in, in lieu of aging together since that um, since we the nurse left she's going to be taking it over we're calling it building resilience and she's going to be doing a twice monthly uh, group for anybody in the community so it will be skills and techniques how you meet challenge how you bring more joy into your life and it's going to be absolutely fabulous we also have um, dr. star from Cooley Dickinson Hospital so she's been a, an immense support to me um, calling me and checking in with me. What do I need? Do I have any questions? And so she's going to also do a Zoom conversation for seniors about health issues. Uh, I, you know, I've gotten questions as simple as, I, you know, I have a hard time wearing a mask. Um, how can I get used to wearing a mask? And she's got some really wonderful tips for things like that. Um, so she'll be doing a, a phone conversation with me um, to provide some just general health advice in, in this new era and epic of reopening. We're continuing to look at outdoor classes and the possibility of that. So continue to navigate that as it becomes safe. Right now, as you know, with the Safer Together advisory from the governor in this first step of stage two, um, there's a prohibition on gatherings of 10 or more and also the advisory to, uh, that we're safer at home. And so for those more social gatherings, we're waiting for another step two to kick in and to see if that might be a possibility. But we have that beautiful space um, outdoors in the grassy area that's shaded and could be cool. So we're looking at what, what would be possible so that we could provide that. And also looking at other community spaces. I will say that um, the one of my, for me, the most enjoyable part of um, my service to the community has been that uh, I, I don't have to sit at a desk during this pandemic. I have been out every day and I have so enjoyed going to all over the town and meeting people um, wherever they are. And so, I, you know, I have a better sense of some other spaces and some opportunities for us to do programming out in the community, which has always been the town manager's vision for my role that uh, we do have a senior center, but 
but my job is a senior services and how can we, uh, as we be try to uh, become a, a more inclusive and representative of our entire community, can we meet people where they're at as opposed to keep saying, oh, come on to our place, come on to our place. That, that is an old model that, that doesn't work any longer. Um, and so um, we've been exploring that and looking at some spaces. And again, that will all be with the guidance and the permission of, of what happens from the governor, looking at the Board of Health and the town manager and making sure that everybody feels that um, any arrangements would be safe and appropriate. But I wanted you to just know like that in terms of a direction, that would be a direction we're going at. And then lastly, I have a new partnership with UMass for um, cold lunches. So the Burke truck, um, I had followed around one day to um, all of its stops and uh, they, they have been very generous towards us and they are also making their uh, cold lunches available to any senior. So that will be in the newsletter. They have, the Burke truck goes to uh, seven locations in town and any senior can go up to the Burke truck and just say, hi, I'm a senior and you can get a free cold lunch. Um, and again, you know, maybe you get it and you don't have to eat it that day. I keep saying like, this is great. It's great free stuff. So if you, um, you know, uh, in terms of trying to reach out to more disparate parts of the community as opposed to just being downtown, um, that's uh, an effort. And then lastly, I just want to tell you, I've, I've had some great luck, even though they're, they're, these are hard financial times, um, I've been writing grants, uh, furiously looking for any dollars to bring into the senior center, because I actually at this time it's more critical than ever. And I, I have some good news that I, I have uh, three grants. So I just received word last week that I received a grant from Highland Valley Elder Services uh, towards technology purchases. So we are looking at how to um, update technology um, so that staff can actually use Zoom because much like uh, probably many of you are, well, our, our desktops at work, we don't have cameras or audio. So we have to either use our phone or use a, desk, use a, a desktop at home. And so uh, this will allow us to, to either reconfigure with some webcams we're looking at what's the, what's the least expensive way to make us accessible so that we can continue to access Zoom and support people and also create um, some teaching tools for people about how to use Zoom. And um, also looking at the possibility of purchasing some um, tablets. So for seniors who can't get online, we would have a very small library to be able to, to um, support seniors. Um, if, if I had like $50,000, I'd buy a ton of them. That's, that's where, you know, that's, that's one of my, my earnest goals, I will tell you going forward, because so much is critical online. And Jack and I, um, we were talking about, there's a client who really is, um, she's fabulous. She's in her 90s, but her, her iPad just went kaput. And he's tried to help her virtually, you know, from his location, and he couldn't help her. And when that shuts down and people don't have access, um, you know, it, it just it has a, a domino effect, a social emotional impact. And so, um, I, you know, I, I continue to, to speak to legislators also about this, about technology bonds and the needs, just as we have outfitted students with technology, we need to do the same for seniors, because if we're looking at a long period of being closed and, and some forecasts are, are, you know, out to 2021 and, and longer, we need to support our seniors in really simple ways like that of getting them the technology in hand um, because it's it, it's otherwise it's it's um you know that divide remains and, and i think becomes even deeper as a crevasse and then i also applied for a grant to hire five temporary staff members to help with our food service delivery again the town has been fantastic they have lent me um other employees during the time of the pandemic to help deliver food. And those employees are being deployed to other, um, as, as uh, our services change within the town, they've rightfully been deployed to other needy areas. Um, and so I applied, I found a grant for unemployed restaurant workers through Mass Hire. And I applied for four drivers and someone to help in the kitchen. And I uh, received word that I got the grant. So hopefully we'll be adding some temporary support, um, you know, during this time where our numbers have increased immensely in terms of the food production, because I have to say that that's a, you know, I, I have become a, a very good kitchen frau. Uh, if you knew me, I, I'm terrible in the kitchen. I don't like to cook. My kids, everybody knows it. But um, I spend almost all my time you know, in the day 
in the kitchen, helping to pack up, sending out the meals, but you know, my, my life revolves around food distribution. So, um, so I'm really looking forward to that and that just, that word just happened. And then the, um, in terms of trying to get people out in a way that felt healthy and supportive and very safe is I had volunteered at the Amherst Farmers Market uh, the first couple of Saturday mornings and wanted to see how they were set up, what were they doing. Um, and um, it, it's an amazing setup. Uh, they have all the safety protocols in, in place. You know, the town has assured it. They go there five in the morning. Each vendor has plexiglass. You're out in the sunshine. So, you know, that's at, at, at the sciences around, you know, open air and sunshine are, are helpful around uh, this. And, and also there is um, very good uh, watchful social distancing. So everybody has been abiding by it. You know, there's been no issues. Traffic is one way. It's hugely spaced out on the common. And so Cooley Dickinson had given me um, a grant to do some transportation, which we were unable to um, utilize because transportation was shut down. So they've given me permission to use that money. Uh, it's $5,000 towards nutrition. And the identified food gap that I've seen with our seniors is access to fresh produce. So um, they get um, commodities from the food bank, you know, canned and dried goods, survival center, they get some dairy, perhaps some bread, um, some protein, um, and, and, but pr fresh produce has been a bit more challenging. And then the, the meals that are provided either through, you know, for Highland Valley that, the, you know, for takeout, um, don't have a lot of, they don't have fresh produce not at all. And so a lot of clients have called me and said, you know, do, where could I get lettuce? Where could I get more fruit? Where can I get vegetables and fruits? Um, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a win-win. So um, again, I, I, the town manager has given me authorization to work with the Amherst Farmers Market. So we're going to buy $5,000 worth of coupons and our seniors will be able to utilize them at the farmer's market. So we will be supporting our own local business people and our local farmers. People will be able to get out in a very safe uh, manner that will keep them well. Um, and I think it's just, it, it's a, it was one of the best ways I could think of to bring people um, outdoors and also make sure that um, they were getting the kind of nutritional support that it is so important to all of us around fresh vegetables and produce and things of that nature. So they won't, they won't be able to buy like lovely creams, um, you know, and other things that has to be uh, nutritional support. So either plants that they can grow for vegetables or fruit or those items themselves. And then one last thing is um, apropos um, Jacqueline's um, home. It has been, uh, I'm sure for many of you and also myself, a, a period of reflection, of listening and learning about how I can do a better job and how we can do a better job to serve the community and the diversity that exists within this community. Um, I hope you have felt uh, since I have arrived that that's been a priority for me. Um, I've tried to make changes both in, in welcome and in training and in recruitment um, to diversify and also make everybody feel welcome. That just matters to me as a human being. And um, I have a personal commitment to it and I have an organizational commitment to it. And I think that our work is just beginning. Um, and I really look forward to having this conversation with all of you and more uh, broadly within the town. Um, but I just want to say that I commit to that. And uh, I have a statement that I have written um, a piece in the newsletter that addresses it. And one of the ways in which I'm trying to support seniors in this conversation, because I've had a number of people call me um, and not knowing what to do. Um, and so one of the first steps that we, that, that we could easily facilitate in terms of the center as opposed to the Council on Aging is um, I connected with a number of black owned bookstores and we purchased a number of books uh, that are on, on most resource lists to help um, individuals understand racism and implicit bias and its effect. And I think that the, you know, we have to learn and unlearn and listen and read 
as a first step. And so we've purchased those. And when they arrive, people will, it will be, in, it's in our newsletter. And um, I will deliver those to any senior, older adult who would like to do further reading um, and to get those resources out in the community to begin to plant the seeds um, around what it is we should be doing, how we can go about it more effectively and with more heart and more welcome. So um, I am most grateful to all of you for your presence here today. Um, and I miss you terribly. I have to tell you just on a personal basis, I miss seeing you all. It's like I'm the captain of a ship and I have no passengers and I'm not cruising anywhere. And I walk around just looking for you. So each and every one of you, I miss you so much. I miss you at the desk. I miss you in the hallways. Um, there's nobody who wants you back more than me because I, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel a bit lost without you all, but, but I, I hold you in my heart and intentions and, um, if there's anything that more that we can do, we are open for conversation. I look forward to what's going to happen as we have more uh, discussion here. So thank you. And I'm sorry it's so long, but it's been a long time. So. In a long time, and we greatly appreciate all that you have done and continue to do. And also appreciate the um, caution with which we're moving forward in terms of opening up and um, the whole thing about being careful. And I felt that way about the town manager's um, last statement of values, top on the list was the health and safety of the community. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that so greatly. And I feel thankful that we live in a community where people respect those rules. Um, I had spoke with a friend the other day who went to Northampton and said you would never know there was the risk of a virus there, that people were walking around, almost nobody had masks, and the streets were full. So we can be thankful for the caution that everyone around us takes. Thank you, Mary Beth, so much. Did you wanna say anything um, at all about the census or the um, senior center nurse? Um, the Senior Center Nurse continues to provide services, a telephonic con um, consultation. So anybody who has a question, you can contact her. She has a specialty also in diabetes. So she obviously is not going to be seeing people one-to-one, -one, but at this time she still remains available. She's available by email or by calling. And if you're unsure, you can always just call the Senior Center, 259-3060, and I can connect you with her. Her name is Karen Raynan. And um, she's a tremendous resource, has a, has a wonderful background in uh, nursing, and she is available. And then the census follow-up, we've been trying to uh, continue that drumbeat with everybody. Um, we've been sharing the materials still with uh, you know, our, our more vulnerable clients through home-delivered meals and takeout lunches. And then we recently ran a list of every person who had come into the senior center from January till now, there were about 600 people, and we'd begun to call those, those folks individually because we had looked at the prospect of the phone banking effort that was underway, and we thought we had our own database that would really um, help serve us more directly with the people that, that know us. Um, and if we called about the census, they probably would, would take our phone call and actually pick up um, as opposed to just, you know, dialing people who don't know us. So if we call from the Amherst Senior Center, we find most of the seniors will speak with us. And we've been helping them over the phone. It's been an easy process. My social workers have been doing it and um, helping people to complete the census over the phone. So we still need to remind seniors as much as possible to, to get counted because it will matter. It's Thanks. critically important. I spoke with uh, Diana Stein, who's been doing a lot of calling for the League of Women Voters, and Amherst is not looking good in terms of census count because the students have left and there's no way of contacting them. And um, so we're looking at like 60% of people have returned the census in Amherst as compared to 70 or 80% in other parts of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So if any of you know of people, just whoever you contact to remind friends and contacts to do the census, it's critically important. It, a, lot, a lot of our funding depends on that. So 
Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Ready. Okay. Um, next on the agenda, I'm going to um, talk about um, the uh, subcommittees of transportation, health and safety uh, later on under item number eight. But for now, um, we'll move on to action items. And the thing before us is uh, board changes. So Tim Neal and Greg Bascom have terms that will expire on June 30th, 2020. I don't know if you've received letters yet, but I know the town manager has intentions of reappointing both of you. So that letter should be forthcoming. Richard Koffler will be going off the board on June 30th, having completed his second three-year term and the town manager will be conducting interviews to fill that position. So if you know of anybody that's interested in joining the council, please say so, and they can fill out the community activity form. I wanna thank Dick for his service and his very faithful attendance over the years. Um, he was a member of the Long Range Planning Subcommittee and during that time, he helped with a number of things, um, including editing, editing the petition for a new senior center, which we had circulated among seniors at the senior center and got hundreds of signatures. And now they sit in a drawer somewhere, I'm sure. Um, but it was a big effort. Um, he also visited several new senior centers in Massachusetts and help to gather information about these new places, their process and the space. Um, he and Jack with the expertise and knowledge of, of Jack about senior centers created a PowerPoint on the need for greater space for the Amherst Senior Center. And Dick presented that PowerPoint to the town meeting in April of 2019. Mm -hmm. And although it was the, um, we knew that the town meeting was about to be replaced by town council, the intent was to raise the awareness of the senior center needs to the broader community. And since the town meeting was televised and a lot of people attend town meeting, we thought that was a very good vehicle for doing that. And also whenever there was a special, the senior center had a special event or a party or a gathering, Dick was always there to help set up and to help clean up. So we really do appreciate your service, Dick. He is a man of integrity and on a personal level, he's been a role model and a tremendous support to me. So thanks Dick for all that you have done to support and promote the senior center. Okay, we also need to fill the position for chair, vice chair and secretary for FY21. For starters, Sue Dirks has graciously volunteered to serve as secretary for the next year. And since I've been chair for two years now, I will be stepping down from that position so whoever among you would like, be willing to serve as chair for FY21, please contact me. I would be willing to serve as a vice chair and assist anyone who takes on that role. So, and we will need to have a slate of officers and take a vote and elect those officers at our next meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Question, Pat. Yes, hi. Can can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Okay, so, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about um, our process and really all along the lines of what Jack Jacqueline so uh, uh, kindly and um, prophetically shared with us at the beginning of our, our, of our meeting. Um, I guess there's a spirit uh, in myself 
of a desire to look at all our processes uh, uh, in our programming, in our ways of being in community with each other, um, in our vision, um, and so, and, and in our leadership structure. And um, a couple of things come to my mind. One is that um, if there are openings um, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in our, on our leadership team, uh, on the council, that we make a proactive effort um, to uh, continue um, building um, a, um, uh, a more inclusive uh, and diverse structure um, so that new voices uh, can enrich us and inform us um, as we think about, as we move forward. So that's, that's, that would be, that would be, that's one thing I wanted to share. Um, also, I think um, having, I, I would like to say that having um, a process of um, leadership for, um, particularly for the chair, I think really needs to be, we need to uh, look inward about that, but to, to come up with a bit of a slate, I suppose, or have, invite people to identify um, if there, if, if this is a, a responsibility that calls to, to them in a, in, in a way, um, and um, to be transparent, um, I know that I have been approached <laughs> uh, by a couple of people, um, and it didn't feel right to me um, exactly. Um, I, I really care about this, this advisory council and, and, this, and the seniors in, in general. Um, um, and at the same time, um, I, I think that the, our process needs to be more open um, to not just whoever wants to come forward and is willing to do it, but rather to, to really um, uh, uh, invite, invite new leadership. That, that we sort of, we generate our process of, of uh, developing leadership is more collective. I guess that's what my feeling was that it, I think that would be, it needs to be more collective and interactive. Um, and so I, I just wanted to put that out there um, and see whatever other people might be thinking about that. Are there comments about that from other people? Sue. Um, can you clarify, Pat, what, what you mean? Because I'm, I'm not quite sure I'm understanding how, how the leadership can be collective, and more collective and interactive. I don't know what that means. So would you clarify for us? Yeah, I, I just, I think that we can identify, we have some fresh new faces uh, with tremendous leadership experience. Uh, who could step forward. Uh, um, and uh, so I think it's, um, you know, I guess I'm inviting some of our newer members uh, to consider leadership, um, knowing that uh, each of us uh, will support that leadership uh, vigorously and uh, enthusiastically. Well, I think it requires some serious thought. So let's. Um... So I'm I'm talking about Greg and Tim and Jacqueline, uh, who are our newest members. Uh, Yvette is a newer member. So you know, I guess what I like to be direct. I'm just saying uh, it would be, I would. Uh, uh, not to exclude others who are called to this effort, but I think it would be it. Uh, th this is a time when 
I think of um, a lot of reflection and action and um, you know um, I'm, I'm uh, inspired by some of the new opportunities we have to uh, uh, to uh, widen our embrace of all seniors um, in our community and so this 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 would be an optimal time mm -hmm. we, there's you, tremendous Karen. leadership here mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if that helps you, Sue, but. <laughs> well, I think we have to, you have to all think very seriously about whether or not you're willing to step into that role. And um, Mary Beth and I will be happy to answer any questions and help you through the process. So, Mary Beth? Can I ask is if Pat, if what you're talking about is not only a process of self-identification, are you also talking about a process of nominations? So in many boards that I've served in the past, um, when it came time for um, election of a chair, um, they, you know, the, the call would be, are there any nominations from the floor? So I would say, oh, well, I nominate X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and, and I said, in, in most instances, that would have been preceded by a conversation with that individual so yeah. that there was some, sh like, I wasn't just like saying, hey, you know, <laughs> you, you, you step on up, you know, that there would have been some conversation. So, so I just, I, in terms of process, is that, mm -hmm. are you talking about also how to being, uh, like, you know, asking for nominations from the floor as well as a self-identification? That's, I think that maybe Sue yes. asked about I that. Think that what is the process? What does it mechanically look like that you're talking about that might feel more, uh, I don't know, exclusive, yes. um, inclusive? I think that's, uh, I think that's a, a good idea. I think, yes. Well, perhaps we need a nominating committee. How would that work? Tim? Let me unmute myself. <clears throat> well, my opinion is that, uh, Rosemary, although I, you're offered to serve as vice chair, I don't really think the chair should go into being the vice chair. I think we need a new person there so they can develop into a leadership role, just as a general comment. And we're a real small group. Uh, so having a committee structure of a nominating committee, that seems to me, I mean, it's possible, but it seems to me a little bit too pardon the word bureaucratic for us, just a small, small group. So that would be my only comment. If we want to recognize your service and your participation, whether that chair, vice chair, secretary, I don't know if that group serves as an executive committee or not, but if so, you could, uh, the, the chair could become, I don't know, a chair emeritus or something like that and be part of that executive committee. But I would think a vice chair should be a new person. So uh, mm -hmm. we, have sort of developmental um, process in there as well. Well, at this point in time, is anyone willing to step forward to be chair or vice chair? Um, as I see it, um, Tim would make a great leader and Pat would make a great <laughs> vice chair. <laughs> but um, I can't, uh, we need to talk about it. So we'll come together, um, have some conversations behind the scenes and come together at our next meeting. Does that sound acceptable to you, Mary Beth? Unmute. <laughs> Can't hear you. <laughs> I, I don't run the process. I was just here to clarify because I because I do know some processes. So um, I think that that you all have to decide as the council. You know what what is the the what's the process for nominating and for coming forward. And I think you probably need some time to to talk to one another in yeah. some in some yeah. way, and also just to sort of give it consideration of what 
what you know what it would entail and and as pat i think referenced is sort of the call to to leadership is who you know who feels like it's something um and if anybody had any questions about anything i'm happy to to share with them about how i work with the with the chair person um and and you know but I, I do think it's a really exciting time. And I think anyone would have a wonderful time being the chair, the vice chair, or any position. Um, I think that the, the council is really poised to do some exciting work this year. So I invite you all to nominate yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and if you're someone who's quiet, sometimes it's, it's a great time to step forward. You know, when I used to teach, right? There's always, the, you know, the student always raises their hand. And then, and then, you know, there's the, like, I'd like to hear from someone who, who, um, who isn't always at the forefront of speaking. So that, that's just the like social worker, therapist, teacher in me saying, um, it really is a heartfelt invitation for everybody to consider it. And there's no special um, way that leadership has to look. Leadership can look a lot of different ways as we saw with the prime minister of New Zealand. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. I do feel um, <laughs> I do feel that um, there needs to be new leadership for the council, and working with Mary Beth has been a great pleasure, and she is extremely helpful. So think very seriously about it for yourselves, and we'll have some conversations. Okay, and then the next item on the agenda is um, about the mission statement. And I just wanted to say a few things also. Um, make a, a brief statement about all the horrific events that have been taking place across the country. And I think the question in all of our minds is what can we do to put an end to this systemic racial injustice? And uh, that has permeated society over the centuries and it continues to terrorize black people and everyone to this day. We, and beyond that, we recognize that racial disparities affect every aspect of our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We can't sit back and tolerate inequality and unfair treatment to others based on gender, color, race, or religion. And that inequality exists in every aspect of life, including but not limited to healthcare, housing, unfair treatment, education, and jobs. This must really end, and we have to think of how we can help that process. As members of the Council on Aging, we have to be alert to unfair treatment, especially among older people. And we must vow to seek equality for everyone. I think it's important to incorporate that goal in our mission statement. And if you look at the mission statement, it's a start to um, what we had. Uh, replacing what we had before. And I would welcome comments and additions that you feel would be right at this point in time for improving that statement. Sue. Just one word change at this point. Um, you've got the word strive. A couple of times I suggest endeavor as an alternative. Okay. We endeavor to foster self-fulfillment. Okay. And uh, Tim, you also had a comment? Um, I am referring to what you sent as an attachment. So are you proposing the short uh, current mission or principal role be replaced with the few, with the multi paragraph one down at the yes. bottom. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, the first of all, the one down the bottom of the page is I read it does not include any reference to a senior center uh, or a physical location. Maybe we can put that in somewhere. Maybe um, the other 
comment would be in the second paragraph below, uh, regardless of race, color, uh, I might suggest adding like sexual orientation or sexual yes. uh, as well, or whatever the buzzword uh, phrase is for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, and then just, this is more of a grammar thing on the third paragraph, uh, support the needs of older people rather than saying and enhance their social, maybe so as to enhance their social physical, and that's mm -hmm. just more of a grammatical change. So those would be just general mm -hmm. comments that I would. Mm -hmm. I think that um, what you say about the senior center, we could certainly include, we aim to provide and promote a wide variety of services at the senior center. Or you could say including a multi-purpose senior center that support the needs of older adults. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. so it's mentioned. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Mary Beth, did you have anything to add? I, well, I do, it, it is very interesting. So. The one uh, very interesting piece of my job is uh, Nancy Pagano is a consummate historian and has impeccably maintained the history of the senior center. And it has been interesting as I was looking at the issue of the mission statement mm -hmm. um, to, to go back through minutes of the Council on Aging, even going back to 1967 when it was founded and mm -hmm. to get a sense of what was the history and what is the present. and um, and I will tell you, even back in 1968, they were, they were trying to reconceive the mission of the Senior Center because they felt that in one year it was already outdated. Um, and so I think the, the process of looking at a mission statement is an important process and is iterative through time and reflects um, both changes in need and services and culture and community and awareness. Um, I will share that um, I, I, um, I think it, that um, language around serving diverse communities, um, I, I've looked at other mission statements from other communities as to sort of help me understand my job when I first entered and, and ways um, to share that. And so I, I guess it is to say that I have, I have other samples I don't, I don't have them in a, in a form that I can share screen, but if people want to look at this, um, uh, you know, more broadly and, um, and, and looking at the wordsmithing of it, um, I'm happy to share some, some other examples of some mission statements that, um, that, that I think reflect more um, our future around uh, serving diverse communities. I will say that for the purposes of my budget, um, I just crafted, I crafted some additional language that I used in terms of the, the budget uh, reflection of what my mission was because I felt like what had been previously set didn't, didn't capture our work fully um, and, and the urgency of um, becoming more of a community outreach um, service. So so I, I don't have anything final to say, except that I, that, um, yeah, I, I think that, that it might be helpful to look at other examples and other um, ways that people have reflected that. Um, some have also done mission statement, core values. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I think that, that there might be a group of people who might be really interested in taking that on as a, as, um, a good point to, to sort of connect these dots um, about where we are in this time and how, how much more I territory I need to cover um, in terms of what, what my staff and I do and, and how we function in leadership or organization. So that's... Um, so if, if you have statements of other samples of mission statements, or if you have copies of those, could you send them to everyone yeah. on the board? That would yeah, be, yeah, so that I, would I, I do have a, a file that I had been using just for, for my own purposes because I, I think that for me, a mission statement is a, is a North Star and I use it um, 
as a, as a statement of values of how I make harder decisions and okay. um, where I'm using the limited resources that we have and, and whatnot. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's an interesting process to go through. Okay. Um, yeah. That would be great. Okay. Okay. Any other comments about that topic? Yes. Yes, Pat. Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, you know, reflecting, um, I just wanted to add to that, that we're already transitioning to a view of, of uh, uh, en engagement that involves not just the physical location uh, of the bang at, at Bangs Community Center, but um, is in, embedded in, in, in small com, uh, communities of elders and other places in our community. So uh, capturing that, I think, reflects our aspiration and our, our activity now. So I would hope that, that we would uh, sort of ratify and validate that because I know that's something that Mary Beth's already doing. So that's part mm -hmm. of it. But also, I, mm -hmm. I want, uh, I, I would welcome, and I have, I have some language what I, that I would like to share about um, just basically, uh, which is we, str we commit to creating activities, practices, and skills mm -hmm. um, that enable and embolden uh, older adults collectively and individually to advance a more just and humane community. Um, so that, that is a commitment. It's, it's not, it's mm -hmm. not negotiable <laughs> in mm -hmm. a way. So mm -hmm. that, so that it, it, in a way it's a statement of values. And so I, I endorse also that, that, that our values, there's some sense of values in, in our mission statement that, help anchor the way we do things, what our processes are, that they are open and transparent and inclusive, so that that, 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 that language uh, um, inspires us to, as, as we move forward. So, um, I, so I'll share that language with, uh, with the two of you and, and, um, and some, uh, um, and I'm deeply curious to see what other uh, mission statements of other uh, mm -hmm. of other um, um, councils um, have as well. Okay. 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 To be continued. I, I, I am I speaking? Jacqueline, I think is is trying to chime in. I, I see her light up, but I don't know. Yes. Yes. I I want it. I want. I don't know because I'm not seeing people, and even if I saw, I don't think I'd know everybody by name. But the last comment, I think, speaks volume. And uh, I would be willing to, if there's going to be a subcommittee working on um, revising the mission statement, I would be willing to serve with uh, other uh, people who are doing that. How do people people feel about a subcommittee? You, um, who would be willing to be on a subcommittee to work on the mission statement? Pat, I certainly would be happy to do that. Okay. So the three of us. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Did is somebody say Mary Beth? <laughs> I, I thought I heard somebody say something about Mary Beth. Okay. All right. Well, let's get together then. And um, please, Mary Beth, send us those um, sample statements to each, the th myself, Pat, and Jacqueline. And we will work on that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And then... Um, You've all by now read the secretary's report, which Norma Hallett prepared from the last meeting in March. So do I have a motion to accept that report? Second. 
I move that we accept the minutes as written. Okay. Is there a second? I second that motion. Okay. The minutes stand approved. Thank you, Norma. And um, I have here on the agenda the Friends of the Senior Center update. That's pretty much. Um, on hold for now. It has had a lot of health problems and um, there of course haven't been any meetings or any opportunity for fundraising because of the COVID. So it's, things are in limbo. Did you wanna say anything more about that, Mary Beth? I'm mute. I do, here I am back again. Um, I just, I think that for purposes of the meeting, um, uh, the only way I think that it really impacts us is that um, we're not able to gather the names and the amounts of donors for the newsletter. And I know that that's, that's a section that many people have um, look, just look forward to, to, to a way of being acknowledged. You know, it, it, um, it's a very trying time for the friends as it is for all of us, um, the, the methods that we had in place for them to pick up, you know, the mail was sent to the senior center. So I've been trying to work with them to get it sent to a, another, like a PO box um, with a mail forwarding because they, you know, they can come into the center and, and they didn't want to leave their houses rightfully so, you know, they're sheltering just like every other one of you. So um, I guess I, what I would just ask of the community is to have patience uh, with them for any acknowledgement, both more widely in the newsletter and also personally with uh, the notes. So um, the one thing is that uh, we don't have our administrative assistant. Um, she's been transferred to Puffer's Pond. So she previously helped out the friends to uh, get those thank you notes in order and, and I don't have that staff person any longer. So, um, you know, this is all, it's all in flux and so, be patient, you might, it might come in the form of a Christmas card. So, <laughs> and, and they are, they are, they are uh, entitled to their, to their respite, just like uh, so many of us. Um, and, and it's just, it's operationally very difficult for them. So I just ask for patience from the public uh, for, on their behalf, because they, they've, they have carried the senior center. They provide over $35,000 of direct assistance every year. And without them, I would not be able to open my doors. I couldn't have a cup of coffee. I couldn't serve uh, uh, anything on a paper plate. Um, everything that we do is funded by them. They fund our operations. They are my operational costs. So, um, you know, I, they, they are critical and have been kind and generous only to us. So I just ask to, let's give them a pass for now. And when, when they're able, like the rest of the world to resume, that will happen, but till then, we're on pause in terms of those mechanisms. So I just, I thank them and wish them well. Um, thank you. Norma, are you able to give a report on Highland Valley Elder Services? Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, there were no meetings of the Nutrition Council um, that was for the whole group, for the whole council, um, which usually meets every other month. We met on Wednesday in March, the first Wednesday, and I reported on that at the last meeting that we had um, with the Amherst board. But uh, there had been two meetings, virtual meetings of the board of directors. And I think I had mentioned at one point that we would, um, we were able to say certain things. It's a private group, but yet they want to um, be able to talk, you know, give information to the senior centers. So um, this last time, Alan um, Wimet, who is the CEO, uh, writes a detailed report every, you know, summarizing the executive side every uh, month. And he has kind of put down some key words to say what, what is okay to share. 
So I'm not going to go into anything on personnel things or phys or um, financial um, stuff. But but here's what I've written. Um, on the fourth, we met five four twenty, which was a virtual meeting um, and a little shorter than usually two to four. Um, and two main topics were really dis discussed. And one was since the um, Allen has to be evaluated every year, um, the personnel committee has got a new form and it's six pages in length. And I mean, I don't even understand all of the things they said. If you don't understand what this means, just don't fill it out and just say not applicable for, you know, it's, um, you know, a lot of financial stuff that I don't usually get into. Um, but we discussed how the agency um, is handling the pandemic and the board uh, decided in view of not knowing what will happen this fall, that the expo that we'd had the past two years and um, was much more successful last year than the previous year where I dragged Mary, Rosemary to it. Uh, but anyway, they, um, I'm on that committee, so we're gonna start again and try to do something next year. Um, and then the board met on the 1st of June, again, virtually. And um, this is, there's reports from each um, committee in the agency. And I'll summarize just a few of them that I feel are most important to us. The so human resources has an opening for a coordinator and an accounting clerk. Um, and PQI is the quality insurance, um, and they've issued a non-competitive $3,500 grant to all area COAs. And I still have a question on this because um, it, it, somewhere I read that Amherst couldn't accept that. Is that right, Mary Beth? Unmute yourself. The, the Amherst couldn't accept it. And I, I talked to the president because um, I said, you know, I don't understand this. And she, she uh, it was not written in Alan's report that no one could accept it. So I didn't know if it was some conflicting grant that they got that they couldn't. What is it you're referring to that, that, that we couldn't accept? The, um, it said that all um, seen, they were offering some money to all senior centers um, in each, in their jurisdiction, a $3,500 grant yeah. to all area COAs. That I got it. Oh, you did get it. Okay. I sure did. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, good. I, I said that doesn't make sense to me. But, and, and the president said, oh, I'll get back to you. Well, that was last week and I haven't heard. So, okay, that's good. Well, that's why I didn't write anything in. So. Yeah, that was the technology money that I referred to. Oh, okay. $3,500 and, and I applied and I did get it. Yes. Oh, good. I okay. All right. yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then um, the, the uh, quality assurance, um, they've added COVID rate adjustments to providers and would like to add more services. Um, the agency is on track to meet the new EDV, which is the electronic visit verification requirements. And um, IT is installing new phone system and it'll give them more capabilities with less cost. Uh, home care uh, plans for coronavirus have been implemented and documented and they're in the process of developing a new risk assessment for home delivered meals. And it seems that um, they're working on it, that technology was the main thing. And I think it's the choice meals that they, you know, they don't, haven't been offering at the congregate meals. And um, so they said they hope to make some decisions by the end of June, it was going well. So. 
um, protective services has not had much outreach, but has done virtual checks. And um, if necessary um, and need be, the group is able to have home contact, but it's a last resort. Um, and the Omsbud person, uh, they have volunteers that visit people in nursing homes once a month, um, at least once a month. And um, they, of course, have not been able to do that. And so they've been going outside the nursing homes and holding signs saying they're still available for them and that they haven't forgotten them and they just can't come in due to the virus. So, um, you know, that, that has been going okay. Um, and the, um, yeah, some facilities have COVID cases of residents and staff, but it seems to be on the decline. Let's hope so. Uh, nutrition, um, as I said, there have not been the bi-monthly meetings of this committee since last March, but they've had over 100 new volunteers that help with services. And um, the transition has, and maybe that includes part of what you said, Mary Beth, I don't know, you know, but um, they, they um, said that they do at least 200 meals a day. And the community meals have been replaced with take home meals. And the cost of the meals, because with COVID, everything's gone up, has increased about 25%. So I don't know how they're, if they're gonna charge another dollar or what, but. Um, and there's also discussion of offerings um, as an alternative choice meal to the home delivered meal, which I mentioned before. So that's what's been going on with Highland Valley. Any when do you meet again? When do you meet again, Norma? Um, I don't know. I thought that they usually. Uh, I mean, I've been on that board two years, and they usually don't have a, a meeting in um, after June until September. But I don't know if that will change, and we'll just do it virtually. Mayor Beth. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify for, for people who might be new to the council, our, our role and relationship with Highland Valley. So Highland Valley Elder Services is a regional catchment uh, senior service provider for over 24 communities. Amherst is one of those communities. And they are what we refer to in the elder field as an ASAP, so an area service agency uh, for providing senior services. And they do everything from nutrition to holistic assessments for case management, home health care, and home health aides. Our relationship with them more directly with the senior center is that they provide us with the food that we deliver. So we don't cook our food. Many sites cook their own food. Highland Valley prepares all of our meals, whether the home delivered or the takeout lunches every morning in Northampton, and then a van um, drives them over to us. And that's where the sort of delivery conduit for our meals. And um, I just would, would want to, to really um, praise them for their performance for our community during the pandemic, because uh, we obviously you know, quadrupled our number of meals and requests very rapidly. They had to scale up and we were one of 24 communities. So you can imagine what that was like for them in the initial stages. And they, they, they met every requirement. They never you know, failed to, to send a meal to add somebody on. When we had difficulties, when you talk about the risk assessment, so the home delivered meals, you have to meet very certain criteria. They reserve home delivered meals for only the most vulnerable individuals. If you, have the, if you have the assistance of a partner, a spouse, a family member, or a PCA to make a meal, they will not deliver one. Um, so because it, there's, there's such a number throughout their 24 communities. But the workaround that I've been able to work with them has been this, this uh, takeout system where I can, there's no criteria for the takeout. All I need is your name and your date of birth and your address and anybody can get the meal. Uh, we were, during the, the pandemic and the surge, we were delivering those meals to Clark House and Ann Whalen because we could walk next door, and we're actually pulling those services back as we're, we're losing some more drivers. But um, the, 
the meals that they provided are just, it, it is phenomenal, their performance. And not only that, but they have gone, um, each of those consumers have also received um, five additional frozen meals that we, we did a, another huge delivery so that if something ever happened, like they anticipated, what if everybody came down with COVID in the kitchen? So people had a stockpile if there was ever an emergency or an exigency that required some support. They also got five um, sort of like sandwich packets to pop in the freezer. So again, if, if they ever ran into any trouble, people would have a lot of, of food stockpiled. Many of my seniors were refusing them by the time the second delivery came around to say, I just, I don't have any more room in my freezer for all of this food. And they also most recently delivered N95 masks to me and also hand sanitizer that went out to their home delivered meal clients and uh, they'll be providing it now for the takeout individuals, which again is just a wonderful supplemental resource. So um, they have really stood up for our seniors and delivered in, in really kind and wonderful ways um, and have been a great partner through this. So thank you, Norma, because your service there and the connection with Amherst and making us known as an important community really matters. And I really appreciate your service and reporting and, and attention to them um, and participation because it, it helps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pat. Rosemary. Yeah. Yes. Uh, excuse me. This, uh, this is Tim. Uh, my apologies to everybody, but I have to change rooms. My wife needs this room for, and she's on another board and she needs it for So I'm going to be walking into another room, but I'll be right back. Okay, great. <laughs> Walk safely. Oh, well, hopefully. Um, Pat, did you want to say something about the, um, Transportation subcommittee. Yes, in the I interest did. of time, we have we promised that Angela that we'd be finished by eleven. So I guess we have to move right along. Yes, this um, will be really quick. So let me just go ahead and say we had scheduled a subcommittee meeting for March sixteenth, and by that time, um, a meeting face to face was impossible. Um, so, and in addition to that, um, everything. <laughs> Uh, everything has changed with respect to medical transport, to criteria, to, um, you know, the things, some of the things that we were thinking of. So it's a whole new landscape. And um, so I would say things are on hold right now. And, and I, my sense uh, with respect to the future of this sub subcommittee is that um, I think it's too early to say. It's not for me to constitute it or dismantle it, but, but rather to say that I think uh, at, during this time of, of change, there are, there are other opportunities um, maybe that um, would take even greater priority um, than some of the issues that we're looking at. I mean, we're trying to do a lot of different things simultaneously. Uh, one of the things that springs to mind, for example, is the, the council's need for looking at um, our financial health, um, uh, you know, and, and really, I, I'm, I, I don't, I can't think of another uh, department or entity of town government that requires um, having fundraisers <laughs> uh, to support operational budgets. And so that, this may be an opportunity for us to re- uh, both to salute the, the amazing work that's been, been done in the past, but also to consider uh, how to um, use this time to uh, at least uh, imagine uh, a more a, a structure uh, that has more security. And I think we have some real talent um, among us, uh, uh, among our newer members, uh, with respect to that, um, that you know will help us. Um, think that through um, with Mary Beth's help and imagination as well. So um, I'm, that's, that's where we are. Uh, we're not, uh, I mean, as, as things, as the facts unfold about um, health and safety and about transportation um, in our region uh, for Amherst Town people, um, then, you know, um, we'll, We'll see what happens and see what the needs are. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's, that's the report. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned something about financial security. Yes. And, and Mary Beth, also, I want to point out that I, I had been um, president of the Friends for a number of years, and I realized as I tried to keep track of money coming in and so on, that the Friends group fundraising raised actually very little money through our fun our fundraisers activities themselves. Most of the money that came in through the Friends came in through the solicitation letter that we send out every January or December. And that was where most of the um, thousands of dollars came from. That and also the envelope that goes out with the town census or the town count. So um, I don't look upon the lack of these little mini fundraisers like tag sales and so on, which bring in $200 or whatever, um, as being a vital source of money. I think we will still continue to get donations from our solicitation letter and also from the census envelope. And that will be the, the bulk of, of what the friends will bring in. I don't see that changing. So. Okay. Um, are there any announcements that you need to make, Mary Beth? Um, you, actually, there's two things that I just would let add is that July 2nd, our budget goes before the Finance Committee. So that might be an interesting meeting for you all to tune into. And then secondly, um, still listed in our panelists is Liz Welsh, who is here uh, on behalf of Amherst Neighbors. And I know that she didn't uh, chime in during the public comments, but, um, and I don't know if she had a difficulty, <laughs> um, but it, they are our, our wonderful partners in the community and they are doing lots of online programming, really interesting pieces. Um, and she and I are talking about collaborating on another kind of conversation around advice for seniors. Um, so if anybody is interested, Amherst Neighbors has launched, they have a website. Um, much, you know, I, I think of their membership at, yeah, at this juncture, just like the Senior Center. In other words, if you come to the Senior Center, we have you become a member, not because there's dues to pay or anything, but it's a way for us to be able to communicate with you and to contact you and, and if we need to get information to you. And so they do have a process for membership, but membership is free. It is open to everybody in the community. So everything that they have is available and free uh, as unless uh, Liz raises her hand and lets me know otherwise, but th that's my understanding. And when I've gone on their website and in our conversations, and they have, there she is, she's raising her hand, great. Yeah. And um, they have some, some, some great, uh, great opportunities for online programming. And I just, I just wanted to put in a plug for them because we're coming to the end and she's been patiently participating. And, and they have some offerings and, and ability to do things in the community that we frankly don't. And it's, it's a beautiful um, example of continuum of services and, and uh, using community resources and, uh, you know, grassroots organizing to also support. So it's not sort of one or the other, it's all of us in this. And so if you want me to recognize Liz, I can. Um, uh, yes. Okay, uh, Liz? Please, Liz, yes, go ahead. Um, thank you, I actually really enjoyed this meeting. I'm really impressed with everything that the Senior Center and the Council on Aging has been doing through this time. Um, and yes, we were about to launch as COVID hit. Um, so really what we're starting with is, is what we thought we'd eventually get to, but not immediately, which is our programming. And just to say, yes, we are a membership organization, but our events also are open to anybody. Because these are we were always going to be doing public events, and those are things that would be open to all. Um, but um, anyway, so if you go to our website, www.amersneighbors.org, you can see the list of the types of um, programs that we're starting with. Um, we had a COVID dialogue, which was a series of three conversations that people have participated in. And we had one on medical advocacy yesterday. Today, we're having a coffee clatch that with, um, um, that's about writing. 
Um, so anyway, you can go on and check out and see the variety of things. And we're, it's, it's going to be important for us to complement also the sorts of things that the senior center is offering and not obviously offering the same things. So Thank we're excited. Um, uh, we're, you know, trying to figure out, but I don't know at this point, given um, kind of the recommendations for people over 65, it's going to probably continue to put our kind of volunteer component that was going to be more traditional on hold, you know, as of now. And Liz, is there also a phone number that anybody, so, so some people yes. want, some people might want to call somebody? Absolutely. Just Thank you. Yes, there is a phone so number, 345-255, or no, 345-355. Thank you so much, Liz, and it's really wonderful Thank to you. have you at the meeting. Thank As you very much. I, I must say, I also have that on my list of announcements, and please do go to AmherstNeighbors.org. I joined one of the groups, the COVID conversation group, two weeks in a row. It was an intimate group of eight people, and we had some wonderful deep conversations um, I would really encourage people to join up. They also have programs on gardening, um, health, um, a interesting program on India coming up. So I would encourage everybody to look at amherstneighbors.org. And then I had one other announcement. Today is a live chat with the town manager at noon. And um, oftentimes, uh, Julie Fetterman, the public health, uh, nurse will, is there, and so if you have any questions for them, do um, look at the town website, and um, I have the Zoom numbers and the phone numbers if you are interested in that, and that's at noon today. But the oh, town yeah. website has it on their calendar. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Anything else? Where, can I just ask, where does, I went on the town website and could not find that. Link. Oh, click on the calendar. Okay. And um, whatever date, you know, click on the date and all the meetings will come up and you will find the um, access information there. Okay. The town website. Yeah. If uh, Liz, give me a call if you have any questions. I'll, um, at, at, actually, you want the Zoom number? I have it right here. Oh, sure. 524 601 Three six four. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Then um, I propose we meet again on January sixteenth at nine o'clock. I mean, sorry, January July sixteenth at nine o'clock. So um, please mark your calendars for that. And. Um, We'll be in touch in the meantime to talk about leadership roles. I, I assume that July meeting is uh, virtual as well through Zoom? Yes, it will be. Yeah. Thank you. Same format. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Everyone stay well, stay safe, and um, look forward to seeing you again in another month. Thank you. Bye. 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 Goodbye, everyone. I miss you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your support. The meeting is adjourned at 11, or yeah, 1055. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.